I want to start off with uh, appropriate uh, things like uh, my disclosures. This is a uh, what's happened at least over the last, uh, my career, I want to put this up there. It, there is a de minimis, no de minimis threshold. So if I've received a nickel, it is up there. Um, and it's uh, pretty extensive. We, uh, I, I spend a lot of time partnering with folks for all the reasons that's important uh, because as you'll soon hear, we know more now than we have done previously, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, I, I should also mention that today's talk as uh, uh, presented, we'll be talking about medicines. What I, what I don't want anybody here to do is leave with the impression of biological reductionism, psychopharmacology as the only form of intervention or anything of that form, um, but this is a topic that um, until very recently there was almost no empiric data. And for that reason, because this is also an area of potential contention, uh, I, I really do want to make sure what, this is what we're going to talk about and not really bring those to the fore today. You know, in the absence of data, you have, again, contention and concern. And what I'd like to show you is uh, the data that are uh, really available. I, I want you, as we go through this, other than the litany, to just Pay attention to the years at which these pivotal papers have been disseminated. And you'll see that they're all terribly recent. And going back to government policy, a lot of this is actually driven by our federal laws that have mandated that treatment studies be conducted in young people. Uh, and for example, under the auspices of the Best Pharmaceutical for Children's Act. So I, I just want to make sure you see that what used to really be tribal lore, for lack of a better term, uh, has actually turned into something empiric. So the first place to do is, uh, again, because really with any uh, uh, medication lecture in youngsters, it's, it's essential to at least highlight FDA approval and every CME that you complete asks about off-label stuff. So here's the label stuff. And you'll see that there's a variety of different uh, agents that are at least approved for uh, mixed and manic states. And the pivotal studies that led to the indications I have behind you, uh, I'll, I'll highlight as we move along. And so that by the time you are done listening to this, you'll pretty much have been presented all the pivotal studies that exist in the field. Which, you know, the fact that you can fit it into an hour is something that uh, at some level is makes it good news for me, because then I get to be an expert and only know a few studies, which is good. Um, uh, the bad news is that's all we know, which is probably not as good. So with that, let's just talk about, firstly about the acute treatment. As you know, phenomenologically, this is a chronic condition that's associated with spontaneous mood episodicity. So we're not talking about anything that is on some kind of idiosyncratic modified spectrum, but we're really talking about uh, what one would be describe as unmodified patients with unmodified criteria with spontaneous mood episodicity that's longitudinal. But, you know, first thing is get, if the horse is out the barn door is getting it back. And so I'd like to start off at least with lithium. And this is, um, you all paid for this for those of you who are taxpayers. So this is a, uh, there was a RFP issued in 2005 looking for basically drug development from phase one through phase four of lithium in young people. And, you know, lithium's first reports for its efficacy, at least in the modern era, dated back from 1949. And at the time of the RFP came out, there was nothing of real methodological rigor to confirm or refute what role lithium may have in the same condition when it exists in uh, kids. So, of course, with any pediatric study, as you all well know, you need an acunate, the cuter the better, and of course you need a logo, logo and see, you got a little pony, and you got the horseshoe thing, and you'll see that this is a th another theme that will come up. Um, so we published our methods, and basically a modified recapitulation of our RFP re response in 2008, and the place to start off with, and gosh, I'm sorry it's been a long day, but I had a chat with somebody today, and I'm sorry if I've forgotten whom, but what got me started in this out of the clinic and into at least doing something that looks like science is a conversation with a pediatric pharmacologist who told me you shouldn't study medicines in kids if you don't know how to dose them. 
And, and the reality is, is historically that was not done with any methodological rigor. And so one of the first things we had to do was learn how to dose lithium in youngsters. And you know, I know it's the end of the day, and I'll talk a little quickly through this, but this is a concentration versus time curve. And uh, what I want to simply draw to your attention, there's a triphasic distribution and a terminal elimination half-life. And, uh, and I'll ask you to ask on blind faith that there is linear pharmacokinetics, so as you increase uh, the exposure, you increase the, ex uh, increase the dose, you increase the, uh, the exposure proportionally, and that in fact, despite the fact that children generally have a faster GFR than adults, interestingly enough, the pharmacokinetic parameter estimates are the same in children, adolescents, and healthy adults, suggesting again that you can now dose the medicines similarly across the life cycle which is, again, not terribly intuitive, uh, but, it, but that's what you got. And if we looked for things that varied, that really drove uh, biodisposition, surprisingly, GFR wasn't really one of them. And again, we, it's probably because most kids are kind of healthy and we didn't have any kids with chronic renal disease going into our studies. So here's our pivotal study. This was published in Pediatrics um, not so long ago, and I just want to draw your attention. Here's the, here's the study. It's a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study comparing lithium to placebo. The study design, because we knew it was going to be the one and only one, was a maximum tolerated dose study. And I think that's important. It, we, we didn't drive to a level or a concentration. We actually specifically went forward to a maximally tolerated dose design. And what we basically ended up with a mean lithium, bleh, mean lithium level of about one. And um, ultimately, what we've also found because side effects matter, is really no weight gain. And as we talk about all the antipsychotics in this population, this is a major distinction between lithium and the antipsychotics. And granted, not head-to-head -head studies, but I would also want to point out, again, that you really don't see much separation until six weeks in. And, I'll, and, and I want you to keep that on, uh, also thinking about that as we talk about the antipsychotics. The other thing is the effect size here is, 0.4, Cohen's D.4. And the reason that's important, I'm sorry, the reason that's important is that is the exact same effect size described of lithium in the acute treatment of mania in adults. So what we have found, in short, is that lithium, when dosed uh, with a maximally tolerated dose strategy, basically performs the same across the life cycle which is really helpful because it adds uh, knowledge to an option that has been the most well-established in adult uh, treatment of bipolarity for decades, and it works the same in kids. Just to point out side effects, which again is important, and you'll see some of these, what I want to just draw your attention to is that the most really common challenges these youngsters have, and for those of you who see a bunch of them, are gastrointestinal ones, vomiting and nausea and the like. And uh, to make a long story short, it's obviated by taking the medicine with food. But you know, if you treat somebody for eight weeks, at some point someone's going to take it without, on an empty stomach, and that, that'll happen. Um, but surprisingly, very well tolerated. Um, I'd also want to draw another study to your attention. This is the Pediatric Bipolar Collaborative Study. It's an NIH study. Um, and what it is is a multi-site study that took a, not that many kids uh, and treated them with lithium, divalproic sodium, or placebo. I'd like to point out that there are 50 youngsters in each arm, which again makes it relatively underpowered compared to the other study. But I'd like to at least draw your attention to lithium that doesn't separate from placebo. But again, the effect size of 0.4 just keeps on popping up. Uh, and then for dival products, it was 0.5. And here is sort of the, con the young mania rating scale over time. But in short, what you have is separation from placebo with divalproex with an effect size of 0.5 and lithium with that same magic 0.4. Um, interestingly enough, with the Best Pharmaceutical for Children's Act and the mandate to do multi-site studies, what I'm showing you here is an industry-sponsored study that was uh, published. And what I want to draw your attention to is how short the study is. It's only four weeks long. And interestingly enough, there's no separation from placebo. Now, if you go back here and you look at about week four, you don't, you know, you, you don't get the same splay. 
So again, uh, if it's, I think, more of a methodological question rather than an efficacy question. Now, probably to me, one of the more intriguing questions that have been raised is this one. And this is a study of teparamate. And the reason I think it's important is one of the general principles of pediatric psychopharmacology is that what's true in adults is not necessarily true in young people. And that's not only true for efficacy, but also safety and tolerability. So this is a study that when there was a potential promising signal for teparamate in the treatment of mania in adults, studies in kids began in anticipation of their necessity to be conducted. And so that's exactly what happened. And then when the adult studies had their blinds broken and there was no separation from placebo, in any of the adult studies, the industry sponsors stopped the study, basically suggesting that if it isn't going to work with adults, it's probably not going to work with kids, and stopped. And so what you get is this underpowered study with only about 20 folks in each arm. But gosh, it's flirting with a signal here. And, and so it's, it remains an unanswered, empiric question uh, whether or not this is truly effective or not in this population. And because teparamate generally is not associated with weight gain, it's really an unanswered question that uh, hasn't been answered. And, in, and uh, I, I do have colleagues who use this as an adjunct, particularly in people who've gained weight, not in the, in the absence of all data, but at least on that supposition. But I, I find this very interesting, but sadly unanswered, but I wanted to be complete with you. Now, there are a lot of things people use out in the real world that aren't very effective, and certainly this is a study of oxcarbazepine and that doesn't separate from placebo. We found, it, you know, when we, we did this study as part of this multi-site initiative, we saw, we saw rash, but we didn't see much efficacy. But it was very popular for a while. You couldn't, you know, everybody was on trilepto. Regardless, it seemed to be what, uh, uh, really commonplace. So now that we've talked a bit about anticonvulsants and lithium and the acute treatment of mania or make states, what I'd like to do now is at least shift gears and talk about the atypical antipsychotics, which are the most commonly used agents uh, uh, for this. And what, what I want to show you here is this slide here, because you're going to see it repeatedly with a variety of different agents. And uh, as I had mentioned, many of these uh, studies were conducted as responses to written requests from the Food and Drug Administration to different drug companies under the auspices of uh, government uh, mandates. And uh, what you see here is a, method, a methodological uh, design that was repeatedly requested again and again and again. So you get the same study with different agents again and again and again. So this is a study of risperidone. What I just want to point out to you is you'll see there are three arms. You have a placebo arm. And then you have two other active agent arms, one with a lower dose, in this case, a half to two and a half milligrams a day, and a higher dose, uh, three to six milligrams a day. And as you can see, both arms separate from placebo with really no difference across the arms. And what you do get, despite the lack of difference across the arms, and most people aren't aware of this kind of data, is that at at the end of the day, the higher doses are associated, not surprisingly, with more side effects. So again, it's important to keep these sorts of things in mind. And it's a nice rule of thumb, because as I promised you, you're going to see this repeatedly in a very short period of time. Now, olanzapine is a little bit of, of the exception to the rule, because this was a study that was conducted before a pattern of uh, studies were conducted. And the reason these studies were conducted in the same way as there was actually a, a, a consensus meeting that had people from regulation, academia, regulatory, and got together and sort of said, how do you, how do you study this thoughtfully? So you'll see that most of the studies begin at age 10, go through age 17, involve manic or mixed states, three-arm design. This study was initiated before that consensus meeting, and so this is what you get. This is a three-week study. Let me just make sure you see this. It's three weeks long. It's short. It's a flexible dose study. It's not a fixed dose study. Uh, the mean dose of olanzapine was 8.9 8 or 9 milligrams a day, and there was a 2 to 1 active to placebo ratio. But also the younger age is 13. But what you find is a nice big effect size in a very short period of time. 
And that's pretty impressive, all things being equal. However, the challenge to all of this, I'll draw your attention to the weight gain. So over three weeks, you see the mean weight gain in kilos is about 3.7, which is kind of large. Remember I just told you there was really, you know, and if you compare it to placebo, it's 3.3 kilos. There was nothing with lithium but 3.3 here. But you see it in three weeks, and you see a bigger effect size. You start seeing this clinical decision making starting to come into play here. You know, grant that it's not a head-to-head -head blinded study, but you, you get in a sense of uh, decisions that can be made. And certainly the Achilles heel, as you can see here, really has to do with a substantial amount of weight take early in the course of treatment. Um, so as promised, I'm showing you the second slide of several that look very similar. This is a study looking at quetiapine. Same pattern. You have a placebo arm and two active arms. Now, what I'd also want to draw your attention to is two active arms that are beating placebo. But I want to show you the doses, because we sometimes get these kids come in with a history of refractory mania who are on 25 milligrams twice daily of quetiapine. And I just want to show you the active dosing. You know, remember I told you dosing matters? This is a perfect instance. So the doses are 400 and 600 milligrams a day. And again, not surprising, at higher doses, you have higher degrees of side effects, most commonly sedation, and there's nothing surprising here about that. Uh, Aripiprazole, now you see the slide for the third time. Third drug, third time. I, again, the doses are 10 milligrams a day and 30 milligrams a day. I also do want to point out that these are not starting doses. One of the things that also differentiates children from adults is that in many instances, Starting doses for adults can be treating doses. For young people, you have to start off with lower doses and gradually increase upward, or you have challenges with sedation, nausea, and vomiting. And it's probably due to the fact that these are par is a partial dopamine agonist and probably has to do with its interaction with the area post in the kinetactic trigger zone. Okay. So it works. Uh, again, side effects occur, not surprisingly, at higher doses with no change in efficacy in a head-to-head. -head. Now, we're not talking about individual patients, but we are talking about populations. And um, here's a study of Zeprazidone. And what I just draw your attention to is this medicine does not have FDA approval for the treatment. And the reason is because of the conduct of the study, some of the sites uh, had made protocol violations and therefore was did not deem the study capable of leading to an indication. But as you can see, there's a, a, a hint of a signal here in separation from placebo uh, using uh, ziprazidone uh, versus placebo in this uh, patient uh, population. I also want to point out that acenapine also, again, at three different doses, you can almost see a dose response curve, uh, again, is uh, superior to placebo at any of three different doses. And then so finally, because it's helpful, the differences and the sedation and the, hyper, uh, uh, and, and the hypersomnia and the uh, hyposthesia and the dysgeusia that's part of this sublingual tablet all are present with no real surprises. And so that's what you got. Those, that, those are the acute treatments that we know. And uh, as you can see, the data are reasonably compelling. And they're all acute. And they're all new, honestly. So before, again, we were really you know, taking shots in the dark. There's open label case reports for carbamazepine and clozapine. Double blind work with carbamazepine is likely to be ongoing. But one of the things that we ran upon quickly is that although people do better than placebo with reasonable effect sizes, regardless of what I just showed you, and it was kind of convincing, at least to me, because you see it again and again and again, no matter what you're doing from a certain class of medicine for the most part. About half the people who are treated with these uh, agents respond, and half do not. And so the question is, is gosh, we wait till they're f in full manic states, we really struggle with them until they're really in dire straits. What happens if we kind of caught them before the horse left the barn door? And that's one of the specific things we've been trying to do. So where the place we began is looking at offspring, symptomatic offspring of parents with adults who have bipolar illness, right? So 
Bipolarity has a heritability of about 0.8. We, and, that's an, and obviously that's an important risk factor. So if you have, if you're a parent with bipolarness and you're concerned about your youngster having difficulties with uh, manic symptoms that are spontaneous and episodic, you know, you want to do something about this. So that's exactly what we went out and sought to do. And other than characterize them, that was part of a whole other descriptive uh, piece because we wanted to make sure because the symptoms would be less prominent, we wanted to make sure we could do this accurately and distinguish people with subsyndromal bipolar disorder or bipolar symptoms from other conditions and feel comfortable that we can characterize this prodrome, for lack of a better word, better. Um, for those of you who are familiar with ah, for schizophrenia, you people are very familiar with you know, Meal's construct of schizotaxia. So we coined our own little phrase because, of course, you know, back to being cute, and we decided to call this cyclotaxia. Same construct, high-risk population, worsening over time, moving towards something. And what we did is we took these people and treated them with divalproics or placebo and decided to let, keep, keep them going until either they developed a manic symptom, didn't like it, or whatever. And what you can see here is, honestly, the divalproix in blue looks really good. People really stick, stuck with us for quite a long time. You know, if you look over here, it's, you know, four or five months, doing, cooking along great. But the good news, I guess if you didn't want the drug to succeed, the good news is, gosh, just being in a clinical trial looked really helpful, <laughs> which is good. I mean, honestly, this goes back to if you catch the horse before it's out the barn door, like anything in medicine. If you wait until they get into the ICU, you're going to have to really do big things. But if you catch it earlier, you have a chance to do more with less. And, and, and you know, this is a big deal. And again, this is a, a really important area that has been unstudied about uh, really the prevention of this uh, uh, condition in people who've been accurately identified as potentially being at risk for developing it subsequently. Now, what we also then did, like anything else, is we wanted to identify, and this, these are post hoc analyses with all the caveats that come with that. What we wanted to then do is say, all right, is there anybody for whom this might be worth something? Um, certainly, as you know, things get lost in means. So what we did is a post hoc analysis, and what we found, almost not surprisingly, is that if you had multiply afflicted family members, there really was a benefit from receiving active medicine. However, if you only had one, or one parent or one other family member, it didn't seem to make a difference. So of course, this looked like a testable hypothesis, because it was a post hoc analysis. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, we, and this is a paper that, the data are in clinicaltrials.gov. We're on our second or third revise and resubmit. Hopefully, it will be accepted soon. You know, you always have that last reviewer who has one more thing, and that's where we are with this right now, so I can't see it being a, a deal breaker. Uh, but suffice it to say, we took a group of youngsters who were uh, the offspring of at least one parent with bipolar disorder, but we did two other things to enrich the cohort based on our prior data. The first thing is we, we did is ensured that all of them had at least four sessions of some form of mood-focused psychotherapeutic intervention before they could be entered into the study. And secondly, they had to have three or more family members in first or second degree relatives, again, based on our prior data. And when you do that enrichment for those who look particularly vulnerable, what you get is this, aripiprazole being substantially better than placebo. And just to give you a Cohen's D, which is sort of my, my sort of parlance of choice, as I understand whether or not, you know, because you could just add as many people as you want to get your p value where you want it to go, kind of. Uh, Cohen's D of about 1.1, 1.2, which is not a bad size for a, an intervention of a relatively brief period of time. So that's sort of our at-risk population work. That's what you saw right before you in about three or four slides is about a decade's worth of treatment research 
um, at least boil down to its core treatment essence, never mind how to identify these folks and the instrument measurement development and all that sort of stuff. But gosh, the years do go by fast as do the slides. Um, so let's talk about bipolar depression, of which there's even less work. At, in, in, in 2017, at this point in time, there's only one approved FDA agent, and this is uh, a combination uh, of fluoxetine and lanzapine, uh, sometimes marketed as Symbiax. Um, but the first agent that was studied a lot, because it is really effective in adults with bipolar depression, is quetiapine. And as you can see here, if you get on quetiapine, you have pretty high CDRSR scores, which is the gold standard. Uh, and you have a very nice reduction, um, which is great. And this is a two-site study, so it doesn't even have the confounds of multi-site, large-scale studies. And then again, however, with placebo, you start off at the same place due to the uh, sometimes uh, beauty of randomization that sometimes can serve you well. Uh, but gosh, you get the same result. You know, so again, um, although this is a talk about pharmacotherapy, you can see, as, as I try to sort of suggest this, there is areas for non-pharmacological intervention that hasn't actually been adequately explored yet. Uh, and I'm raising those issues not because there are empiric data, but it does highlight some of where, where I think some of the questions are. Um, and and it, again, I want to make sure I, I at least mention that. Same study, bipolar depression. Again, both agents work well, but there is no difference. Um, so again, although it, it's a powerful agent in adults, it's really not terribly effective in children. Kids really are different. So here's a study that really led to the uh, labeling. But again, it's an eight-week study. And again, I just want to point out, in an eight-week study, it's a 4.4 kilogram weight gain, four kilograms over a relatively brief period of time. I mean, it's coming at a pretty steep cost, acutely. Um, just to highlight what the scores are, again, you, got, you have a decrease of basically uh, p-value of 0.03 using a regression model. So that's pretty much everything there's been about the acute treatment of mania or, or depression of any methodological stringency in the field. You have now seen it all. So you, that's good. You're experts too. You know, all you, all you need to do is now just pull up the slides and off you go. Um, but obviously this is a chronic condition. And surprisingly, there's very little about maintenance treatment. So the first thing we started grappling with back in the day is, gosh, it seems that for a lot of patients, you need two medicines to get them where they at least seem stable. But the question then became, do you really need to keep people on two medicines? You know, okay, no one's keen about one. Certainly people aren't keen about two. But if you got two, can you get away with one? So that's exactly what we did here. We took a group of youngsters with uh, mostly bipolar one and a manic episode, treated them with combination divalprolix and lithium for up to 20 weeks until they got better. For, uh, and, and once they were better for four weeks, completely in remission, we then randomized them to monotherapy. So they're on two medicines, and then we randomized them to one. There's no placebo arm. It's just a double blind, double dummy, double substitution so that you end up with two medicines to one and you got tapered off of the one you were not assigned to in order to, again, minimize the acute relapse that's oftentimes associated with abrupt medication withdrawal. And we looked for a lot of people, and gosh, it took a while. This was a labor of love for, that took many, many years. Um, and I just wanted to show this slide because this is, in my mind's eye, a really important piece of information. First of all, we were able to stabilize these kids who were unstabilizable 43% of the time. And the major reason they didn't get stabilized is they didn't stick with the medicines. Non-adherence, again, back to something that is a different narrative, but adherence to treatment is, is not a surprise to anybody, a major obstacle. 
and we actually had somebody get a K award based on these data uh, in our shop to specifically look at factors associated with adherence. And then there were other things as well that happened. The medication intolerance, I can uh, be, uh, frankly tell you, was mostly having to do with uh, the surprise at the high rates of thyrotropin elevation we found along the way that we weren't anticipating. And now, if you, the reason we didn't have all those discontinuations in our pivotal lithium study that we did under the uh, auspices of the NICHD was simply due to the fact that we now built in an algorithm to address it. And, but what I'd also want to point out, honestly, is you know, me, sometimes people don't show you their imperfections. So we were wrong. So we actually had two people that we thought had ma mania, but they actually had schizoaffective disorder. So that's, that was about 1.4%. Um, and I thought that was important uh, to point out. But what I'd also like to uh, highlight is that a lot of these folks generally did well as long as they sort of stuck with it and we knew how to address their thyrotropin elevation. But what we also found is, gosh, you know, with this lore that Depakote was better for rapid cycling and lithium was an old and dirty drug, what we found actually was that there was really no difference between the two. None. But probably what was most sobering is now these are kids who were stabilized on two medicines. We treated them with one medicine, so they were all on something. I'd like to just sort of start at their survival. A little over a month. That's really sobering. You know, because we, you know, no one here, well, I was going to say no one here. I am not, and many people are not excited about putting in lots of medicines into youngsters if we can avoid it. And what we found here is, gosh, it really didn't work out well when we tried to get people uh, on less medicines. Here's a double blind study looking at aripiprazole. Again, what you can see is ac a, a continued acute treatment is maintained over the course of intervention. And uh, ultimately, though, time led to lots of discontinuation, usually due to non-adherence. Now, I was very privileged in Cleveland to be working with uh, colleagues who were experts in the treatment of adults with bipolar disorder in an enormous clinic and uh, for adults. And we kept on having their uh, symptomatic offspring referred to us. And I guess the point I wanted to make was we were sawing, seeing kids that I had never seen before because we had kids with, you know, not only the offspring of one parent, but oftentimes bilineal pedigrees. And we found that the more family history, the earlier the age of onset. So we were seeing kids that I had never seen before, and they were looking young, under the age of 10, which is where all the data started. So we had to do something. And what we learned was, you know, although parents were concerned about acute treatment in their younger children. They also saw how symptomatic and uh, impaired they were, so they were kind of OK with that. But then the next question is, is, do we need to do this anymore? So that's exactly what we went out to do, is started to do a maintenance study. And what we did is we stabilized youngsters and then randomized them to continue treatment versus placebo. So the first thing we, interestingly enough, did is pick up a very nice nocebo signal that at the point of randomization, we told them when randomization was. We didn't try to blind it. We saw a lot of attrition. But as you can see, despite this nocebo effect early on, you can see that there was a real distinct superiority of continued active treatment versus placebo. And finally, this uh, is a, something that we see a lot of, at least in Baltimore as well as in Cleveland. A lot of youngsters end up on lamotrigine. And what we found in this large, multi site study is that there really, if you look at the primary outcome measure, there is no difference between lamotrigine in blue and placebo in green in a group of youngsters between the ages of 10 and 17. No difference on the primary outcome measure. Now, conversely, if you break it up by age groups in a post hoc analysis, you see that there is no separation in the younger kids but it was, what appears in a post hoc analysis, with all the caveats that come with it, at least a signal for teenagers as a maintenance treatment. So ultimately, the primary analysis wasn't statistically significant, but it looks like, in fact, that the safety profile was the same and maybe a potential signal for effectiveness in 13 to 17-year-olds. 
And finally, I want to talk about comorbidity because that's, you know, I'm giving you a Cook's tour, uh, and hopefully if there are questions that are in greater depth, uh, of course you'll all be welcome uh, to pose them to me uh, after. So surprisingly, um, historically, the comorbidity with substance abuse is a common difficulty, and there was one double-blind placebo-controlled trial that suggested in folks with uh, bipolarity or at risk for bipolarity and comorbid substance abuse that lithium was associated with reduced numbers of positive toxicology scores. And that really started things along. The next thing we looked at because of the comorbidity with ADHD was adjunctive psychostimulants. Now this is a very busy slide, but just to summarize what you can see here is that as you go down, your ADHD symptoms go down and your mood symptoms stay the same. ADHDs go down, moods do not worsen, which was really our concern. Probably to, again, boil things down to its greatest essence, the Cohen's D for stimulants, in, or methylphenidate in this population, was 0.9. And as you know, that's about the generally accepted defect size for a psychostimulant in typically developing kids with ADHD without mood disorders. So what we found in the acute treatment, that there really doesn't seem to be much to do here, and that when you had people, uh, you could actually continue to do well. So again, back to logos. Um, we talked a little bit with some of us today about uh, one of the things th that we were doing, this longitudinal assessment of manic symptoms. As you can see, it's got a cute little, oh, by the way, this cute little lamb, see, notice it's a lamb, it's cute, it's a nice little leg logo. I'm, I can say with pride that that lamb was drawn by my daughter. Now you could say, oh, isn't that cute? Well, it's not that cute, because we did this study for a long time. Right now, she's the, in charge of uh, development and alumni relations at one of the two prestigious all-girls schools in Cleveland, even though she went to a public school. In, but she, so the, this chief of development for an alumni relationships at an elite girls school in Cleveland, actually, that's how long this study was going, because I assure you, she could probably draw better than that now. And every time I show her that, she is absolutely mortified that she was ever young enough to do that. But she, she was. I, I was there. Um, and of course, she reminds me she got a master's degree in you know, four years, and she's not a, you know, not a baby anymore. So yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, but it's always nice to point out to her that I'm, it, you know, being old has got a few advantages. So that's lambs. And, what we, and it's exactly what it says. We t identified a group of youngsters with manic symptoms and followed them over time. And really, what, this was driven by the question of concerns about the overdiagnosis of bipolarity. So we took a symptom. And pre, this is all pre RDOC. And really just identified people due to a symptom. Uh, and found out really what happened to them over time. And we've had neurocognitive data that I'm not going to show, as well as um, neuroimaging that we've been publishing on. And it's all been a lot of fun. But I want to just talk a little bit about the cohort ascertainment, because I want you to see what we found out about some of the medicines. So we you know, screened about 5,000 kids. And we ended up, again, screening them with a 10-item uh, instrument, which was relatively brief completed by the parents based on the general behavior inventory. And what we found, simply put, is a cohort of 621 folks who had manic symptoms, as we defined it. And we uh, handpicked with our epidemiologist 86 comparisons from the same group of people we screened. So it's a cohort of about 707 folks. Did I do the math right? Yeah, 707. My mother was a math teacher. She'd be mortified if I couldn't add. Um, so we found 707 kids and basically found that there was really no group differences on demographic variables, but not surprisingly, these kids with manic symptoms were not with living in intact families and had uh, substantially worse functioning, suggesting that this is a signal for something that's not good. That's a technical term, by the way, not good. Um, but what we also learned is a lot about their medicines that all these kids had uh, psychiatric concerns, but gosh, 40 of them were running around untreated. Um, and there was also a, a decent supply of folks who were on three medicines. And probably that, again, is of the greatest concern is the exposure to antipsychotics in this patient population. 
And what we found, surprisingly, is that if you look at the multivariate result, um, prior hospitalization, which is a, was a risk factor, having a psychotic illness was a risk factor, and having bipolar one was a risk factor. And we thought that was idiosyncratic because you know, some of the narrative was that you know, antipsychotics are kind of given out like Tic Tacs, and we didn't find that at all. Moreover, um, we also started hearing about kids being treated with ADHD, with antipsychotics, with, for no reason. And of course, there's high rates of comorbidity. So we actually dug into these 707 kids and found out how often in the community, because these were being people referred into us, did that happen. And we found that it was 13 out of 707 that we couldn't figure it out. So, you know, not, not, uh, not acceptable, but certainly not, uh, uh, not the sizable number we had actually anticipated to find. So in short, I hope I've given you a sense that we have made in the last decade a substantial amount of progress. We've learned things that work. We've learned about things that don't work. We've learned how to dose treatments. We've taken a methodologically stringent approach to treatment. But as you can see, we don't know about enough about the maintenance treatment. We don't know about really head-to-head -head in a methodologically stringent fashion. We don't know how to address side effects and minimize uh, dysfunction and uh, concerns that come with almost all of these medicines, whether it's the weight gain associated with atypical antipsychotics and the other metabolic effects, or if it's the thyrotropin elevation associated with lithium. The good news is at least we've started. And honestly, that is for, for, for someone who trained when none of this information existed, uh, a wonderful step forward. But we should not be satisfied with what we have, and we should continue to look forward and have more. Our patients deserve better. And it's our commitment to them uh, that gets us up in the morning and does these studies because they're labors of love and they're certainly not easy to do. So with that, let me thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be invited for this endowed lecture. And I am open for questions, and hopefully I, I'll be able to answer them. Thank you. In those clinical trials that you have shown, uh, do you know if the children were receiving non-pharmacological intervention at the same time that they were receiving the pharmacological? Yeah, they were not receiving anything usually. Sometimes we, if they were on a stable psychosocial treatment, we let them continue it so there wasn't an extra dependent variable. But as a general rule of thumb, these people had found everything to fail. And so they were usually coming to us uh, in, at, at a point of desperation, actually. So I have a question, but it's a naive question because I don't really work in this, this field. Um, so in a lot of the clinical trials that are being done on fragile X syndrome and other kinds of intellectual disabilities, placebo effects are seen as kind of the, the bane of our existence, right? And, and usually we ascribe it not as that, there's be, that it's effective to be in the clinical trial, but it's usually that we can't trust parent report or other sorts of kind of it's more on the assessment end. I mean, so could you talk about that relative to your view on placebo effects within the context of these kinds of studies? Yes, so despite all those disclosures, I'm going to be a little glib just because I, I, we're amongst colleagues. I love placebo effects. I mean, honestly, if you could find out what gets people to respond to placebo without exposing them to a pharmacologic agent, you know, it's, it's not a cause for disappointment, it's a reason for the hallelujah chorus. And, and that's how I actually think about this. That, you know, we, we learned, we identified people who didn't respond to the nonspecific pieces of being in a study. And I, you know, the reality is, is if parents, I actually do believe, you know, you see placebo response in autism. You know, people, people want their kids to be better. They, people hope their child will do better. So I, again, I, you can't, I, can't, I can't blame the parents. In fact, God love them. They want their kids to be better. So you, you know, that just sets the bar higher. The other thing I would tell you is it's, it, 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 it's, it puts us at vulnerability for quackery. And I, and I mean that sincerely because you know, what people see in their office is not data. So the fact that so many things look like they get better simply by being in a therapeutic or help-seeking relationship with somebody, you know, I, 
means that most of the things you can do in your office, people may find helpful. And that, that really is a siren song that you cannot heed. You know, so in many ways, I think that's the sort of seductive quality of it, that if co people come into your clinic or your patients come to your visits and they're looking like they're getting better because you're doing something, you know, it's not data. Maybe it's just you. It's one of the fun things about working with youngsters and their families. They want their kids to get better. They want to believe what you're doing as well. And you, you know, when we want to also. So I, I think if you're looking for a, an intervention, the bar is high. But you know, also shame on us and not being able to identify the other stuff because, gosh, maybe that's the starting point for all of us. And as we work towards, you know, whether it be an evidence-based psychosocial intervention that takes a great deal of expertise, or a pharmacological intervention that takes somebody who had the poor judgment to go to medical school, you know, wouldn't it be lovely if we could d discern what the placebo response was, and maybe it's disseminatable by people who don't have to have extraordinary amounts of esoteric training in something, or, you know, whatever else that comes with a medical degree. Maybe we can actually do more with a better workforce who are equally committed. I mean, so in many ways, I still see the placebo uh, as a good thing. It does set the bar high if you're looking for some kind of active intervention. And sadly, we've not actually identified, we've tried to identify what that is, and we haven't been able to find it. But I, 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 I don't, I think it's important not to blame families because I think, I mean, you all work with families. They're desperate. And you know, you can't blame them for being optimistic or hopeful. I just, I just can't. So I have a couple of things rattling around in my head. So I know the idea of the, the prodrome phase is becoming more accepted, even though, you know, even just five years ago, people were like, ah, you can't be diagnosed before 21. It's all in your head. It's not real. So, but now people are starting to see that prodrome phase, but I feel like the majority of, I'm just wondering how quickly you think this is going to be implemented, because I feel like most kids that I see are just knee-jerk when they're younger get put on Prozac, um, or maybe treated, they're like, it's not bipolar, it's, you know, you've got ADD, when they might, but, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, poor morbid, so they're, even though, like, the SSRIs, there's not, like, this huge body of efficacy, it just seems like it's the knee-jerk reaction to give kids that, and now it seems like it's more pop, you know, popular, we give the, you know, atypical antipsychotics, and we have all the side effects, I'm wondering if with these, is lithium going to finally maybe become more, like, because I, I always wondered why it wasn't. I know there's no studies, there's no studies on anything, but do you think lithium will maybe become a more, because it is, has been the gold standard, will it become more of a first line for children or for adolescents? So I, I can answer that question, which is the answer I, I believe is lithium will not likely be the first line for anything. Um, only because it requires blood monitoring. It has a narrow therapeutic window. Um, it's associated with a lots of nuisance side effects. It was associated with a 20% increase. In, 20% of folks have an increase in thyrotropin levels. It's, it's a marvelous treatment. It's also really terribly labor intensive. It's associated with a lot of nuisance -y sort of things that we ask people to live with. Um, whereas, you know, in many ways, we don't have the, the greatest thing for anyone yet. So uh, I think at the end of the day, you know, with lithium, it's a, it's a complicated medicine to use, and there's some dangerous drug-drug side effects that exist with it. No, it seems like it works the same across the life cycle. Huh. I mean, that's what the data show. So again, I'm not talking about anything other than data, because, you know, honestly, you shouldn't care what I think be what the data show if we have it. And we got data, and that's good. But yeah, not, I don't see it anytime soon. It's too hard, too complicated. Thank you so much. This is a great presentation, very helpful. Um, when we see pre-adolescents with um, what appears to be a mood disorder, possibly bipolar disorder, what are some of the um, suggestions you have for especially younger clinicians to help them Number one, differentiate from main comorbidities that seem to be a, a great challenge, and also what to look for more carefully so that they will feel more comfortable about their diagnostic approach. 
Thank you. Well, thanks for the uh, kind words. Um, first thing that comes to mind is we described our first 90 youngsters with bipolar one, and in the discussion section, this was before word limits mattered, we went through this whole litany about why these kids could look chronically irritable when they really aren't, and what the what made it difficult to diagnose them. So if anyone wants some late night soporifics to get them to bed, um, we published this uh, paper in Bipolar Disorders about our first 90 kids, and the discussion really talks about some of these challenges. To boil it down to its essence, it's looking for spontaneous mood episodicity, specifically looking for periods of abnormal elevated mood, because pretty much almost nothing causes abnormal elevated periods of mood, and nobody, nobody usually asks about that. Um, and it's not about grandiosity, it's really about abnormal elevation in mood, and that's really the one symptom that is the most derivative. Family history, it's not does anyone have bipolar disorder? As many of you know, people with, adults with bipolar disorder often goes more than a decade without an accurate diagnosis. So asking, does anyone in the family have bipolar disorder ain't gonna do it. So it's, but it's a careful, meticulous family history. It is a careful longitudinal course. It's an identification of spontaneous mood episodes and characterizing them if they exist. Um, specifically looking for abnormal elevations that are really quite distinct. Uh, and, and that's really, it. there's no magic to it, but it, the, the trick of taking the time to dissect a longitudinal course and uh, try to ascertain specific protean mood states is, takes time. And you're not gonna do it in a 20 minute outpatient visit. I, I, well, I can't, if anyone else can, God love them, I can't. So again, it's really taking the time to do that. But those are the sort of things that really are important. But asking about abnormal elevation moods are probably the best place to start. Careful family history, thoughtful longitudinal course, honestly. You know, I think one of the things that was really interesting to me about the studies that you conducted is that you've also followed up kind of, to try to understand something about responders and non-responders. But I mean, in reality, as a field, we have not really gone far enough to understand um, kind of the variation. I mean, because we're often driven, appropriately enough, for the, the first few studies is, is the drug efficacious, recognizing that not everyone's gonna benefit, but we don't really push to understand more about that. I mean, can you talk about that? Do you see the field moving away from kind of just group designs and really kind of taking a different approach to understand variation in response? Yeah, I, 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 that's a great question, and I think that's the ideal. You know, so the, you know, everyone's familiar with the fast-fail model, you know, but no one's decided that there's an actual the biomarker to determine. You know, so it's a, it's kind of, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of misleading. You know, well, we we want we want to find the biomarker that is, a, a, you know, can be used instead of a rating scale, which is great. Before we'll do a clinical trial, which is great. But if you don't have the biomarkers and no one's funding you to identify the biomarkers, uh, it's quixotic, isn't it? So in, in many ways, it's also suggestive that everyone now needs to get their head in the scanner before they can start treatment. And you know, I, I, maybe life is different here, but you know, uh, I assure you, there's not a mountain of moolah in Baltimore that's gonna allow us to put everybody's head in the scanner. Oh, and sit still while they're manic, by the way. I mean, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, you, you know, the, it's an important question. It's a vital question. But in many ways, it's, a, it's, more, it's almost more of a scientific question because I can't see it disseminated in any effective way other than to help develop scientific data to suggest there's efficacy. But I don't think it'll be ever effective at the individual patient level until we have some other form of biomarker of some sort that we can use more effectively. And I don't think we're there yet. Unless anybody here knows something I haven't figured out yet. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.